because you know, I know one of you is burning to get that bottle of wine for the hardest uh, question that can stump Steve or any of our other presenters. Um, I, it takes, gives me great pleasure today to introduce um, Steve Bramley, who's the director of SDL Group New Zealand. Steve is the founding director of um, SDL Funding, which was established in 2002. He has a 30-year career in sport, leisure and funding sector with former roles at the Chief Executive of Sport Northland, Chief Executive of Millennium Institute of Sport and Health, and the Chairman of um, Touch New Zealand. He has an extensive record in leadership, planning, and feasibility funding and project management of many projects totaling over $500 million. Steve will be sharing with us today a topic which I know is close to everyone's heart in this room, and that of money. Thanks, thanks very much, Anita. Uh, when I was briefed by Neil on this, uh, I said, where do you want me to pitch it? And what we've decided to do is, in the next 45 minutes, I'm probably going to try and share with you all the things I wish someone had told me 25 years ago. <laughs> now, Anita's also given me license, just like you're allowed to fire the hardest question you can at me. No one is allowed to yawn in my presentation, it doesn't matter how boring it is. And anyone can get asked a question at any time. Because there is nothing worse than you listening to a presenter making key comments and then you not taking on board the ones which are absolutely important to you. So I'm pragmatic. I have to raise one to two million every month. I don't have a lot of time to muck around. I've got to get it right. I've got to do everything that Craig says. In other words, I'm relying on Craig and others to get the project right but also part of getting the project right is also asking what's affordable. And it's a mix of need, what you can fund, and what you can sustain. And I'm sure Craig's talked a lot about sustainability. Okay, and then secondly, and I'm a pragmatist, right? Everyone in this uh, world, we all talk about holding hands and collaborating. And sometimes you can hold hands and collaborate, and as this gentleman at the table was sitting there before, and you can hold hands and actually end up in 500 hours of conversations and no further, and you're trying to do the right thing. So when do you just box on and do it? When do you hold hands? And there is some smart times to hold hands, so let's go through that shortly. All right, let's rip into it. Okay, you've, you're on task firstly. This came across my desk the other day. Uh, it was a six million project. This happens to why shortly. We're gonna share a little bit more about uh, what should be. Okay, this is gonna be like speed dating. You're just going to get settled, I'm going to move you on, right? So if you lose me, bad luck, I'll come back and reinforce key points. Okay, we've got to be on the same language firstly. If you're a sporting group, what's your annual giving? What's your major giving? What's your plan giving? When you think plan, think bequest. Many sports groups do not have a bequest program at all. You're dumb. It's 33% uh, of all global philanthropic giving. If you don't have bequest giving with our older adult population, one thing to know trends, it's another thing to do something about it. You've got to get a bequest strategy. People care they play your sport or involved in your activity. And in your giving, easiest way to think of this, world vision. You sponsor a child. Major giving, Boxing Day tsunami, you run into, would you make an extra one-off compelling gift? Major gift. Plan giving, they then should line that person up to potentially consider bequest-based giving at a later stage in their life. What is your annual giving? What is your major gifting? And what is your plan giving? Okay, next one, staircase of giving. This is uh, fundraising 201. From the first time they contact your organization, they, uh, I see Andy down there, they jump on the gym sport uh, website. Yeah, they're just checking it out. Uh, what's this sport like? <coughs> Two, then they might rock up as a parent with a child to a gym sports experience. And 
actually thinking about buying a service, but also too, uh, under what circumstances would they consider giving? I saw Ricky and Duncan there from North Harbour Hockey. How well are they tapping into their community that cares? They can get the membership fees and the training fees, but is there a wider parent base that if they actually targeted, a bit like World Vision, they might give effectively $40 per month for an extra coaching program or whatever is strongly packaged that the donor base will care about. So you go from first time donor, repeat donor, to major gift donor, bequest donor. My wife is a classic. She is into World Vision. She sponsors a child, doesn't tell husband, sponsored two children, didn't tell husband, sponsored three children, didn't tell husband. I was getting a bit grumpy by this stage. Um, and then the tsunami came along and she wrote a cheque. Again, did not tell husband. Just broke it to me as my Christmas present. So, but if they don't target it, for whatever reason, World Vision spins my wife's wheels. And so if they should actually position her for a bequest, and if they don't, they miss an opportunity. Okay, it's about people. Positive relationships, trust, confidence, face-to-face -face asking. You're sports people, okay? You're not shy, right? So many people, I oh, will write a letter. I oh, write a letter, expect to get a no, right? You know, the direct mail has a pretty well, a, about a 2% success rate, and that's even with people you know. And people give to people. So it's the right person asking in the right way for the right project at the right time. So I'm just going to use the hockey analogy. If Ricky asked me to get excited about women's hockey when my boys fundamentally play sport, he's probably going to miss the mark. But if he's just matching the product uh, to uh, the donor at the right time, and the reasons people say no, there's only four of them. They don't believe in your organisation or the project. They don't believe in the people. The timing's wrong, or the amount's wrong. It's only one of four. Which one is it? So when you're in a session, you've actually got to actively listen and work out which is it. Is it amount? Is it timing? Is it organisational program? Or is it you? Right? In other words, you haven't actually got the right people doing the ask. Okay, let's keep going. Fundraising 201. Top down, inside out giving for capital campaigns. One of the things you've got to remember, fish with a line not with a net. I walk into so many different groups, oh, we're going to have a uh, fundraiser, we're going to invite everyone. One of the worst examples of fundraising in New Zealand was they invited all the millionaires to a session and they sold them a seat for about 1500 and all the millionaires agreed on the spot, opened their checkbook, and checkbooks were in those days, and wrote it. And they got less than a million and they needed 20. Same, same market gave about 14 million about one year later by personal approaches and each person understanding the level of gifting they had to make to make that project success. You foster ownership, you don't sell. This is what we're trying to do, what do you think? This is how we're looking to try and get there. Your support would be critical and would you consider doing this? Right? It's absolutely crunch. The 18, do not put the poor old person with the fundraising portfolio on their own and ask them how much money every month that they've raised. It gets pretty miserable, right? No one, for some reason, would want to do that role. Funding is fun. You get the best people, people, you put them into a separate group, you grab the best trustees, chair, CEO, you're over here, right? And we're gonna make this happen. And we're gonna optimize every funding source. If you compromise in the 18, you're dead in the water. People asking people, and it's not just within your current management group, it's reach outside to the uh, grouping that cares and recruit. You need rocks and spinners. Uh, surprise, surprise, I'm a spinner. Um, but you need the stable accountant, but you don't want 10 of them, you want three of them. Right? 10 accountants, so with respect to accountants, it's a, it's a certain kind of conversation, right? As opposed to seven people <coughs> who are actually trying to make them happy and let three of them just keep you anchored to keep you safe, right? And it's about trust connectedness, and if you don't ask, you will not receive. I have been through too many situations, I've been doing lots of work inside Auckland Council, I just came to a meeting with the Chief Executive now, I complained to him that none of his team knew how to close. You've got to be able to close, right? In other words, you've got to ask and get a commitment. Okay, let's up the ante. Uh, it's about clarity of vision, vision-based fundraising. Um, if you're just trying to provide a bowling service or a netball service, 
It's actually what you're trying to achieve in terms of participation outcomes, in terms of comp uh, competition pathways. It's assisting people to be the best they can be, your social outcomes, your community outcomes. Are all of your key people on the same message, on the same page? And it's a powerful story. And are you telling it in the best way possible? And often, you aren't. And I'm just being stirring. If you are, fantastic. Secondly, you're trying to do lots of different things. So have you got a managed campaign regarding how you're going to fund each of those, and when you actually have a look at it, maybe you've got to push one, two, three back. So it's an integrated and planned approach to what you're trying to do, whether it's a coaching program, whether it's a facility, uh, whether it's funding core operational resource. Absolutely critical, do not forget this one. Fair share giving. It's asking each person contributing according to their reason to give and their ability to give. So going back to that original profile, if the community is using two gyms 50% of the time, what should council's responsibility be in that mix? If it's a genuine community school facility. I remember fronting a local authority about five years ago, 10 million swimming pool. And they're trying to tell me community raised nine million and we'll put in one million. I was a neutral outsider. I said, forget it. Uh, the benchmark ratio of funding aquatic facilities in New Zealand is 90% council, 10% community. You're setting this community up to fail. Decide whether you need a pool, and if you do, then you have to appropriately resource it. And then it's about a donor based approach. Um, don't make a project fit. You might be passionate about the project, but at the end of the day, the person's into arts and culture. Don't fight it. Move on. Right? Or if they're into a certain type of aspect of your sport, don't try to make them do something over here. You will diminish the gift. You optimise the gift if you find the donor fit. Do not start then being donor-led if they're trying to get you to do something which is going to cost you more. Just quietly say, thank you, but we haven't got a fit. Okay, this goes back to some of the stuff Craig was covering. Get your vision right, get each project right, and if you haven't got the solution right, you cannot fund it. If it's not a smart use of funds, and, and also too, every funder has different criteria. And if you are fundamentally uh, not meeting their needs, well, they don't have to fund you. So again, I just I'm fairly will go back to that gentleman before in terms of council, if they will want a community to use that facility, that's what they're purchasing and that's why they want to fund it. That doesn't mean you can't charge those people, you've got to negotiate that through. But the very clear reasons why a council, or Foundation North, or a gaming trust, or EWI, or whoever it may be, will consider funding. And it's got to be a smart use of funds. Can I use a supply solution? Craig's world is always demand, mine's always supply. What's the smartest way to pull this off? Craig tells me it's needed. Well, what's the best way to do it? Let's take bowling clubs. If Ryman, uh, and others have got a large number of retirement villages. Are they building their bowling clubs on the edge of their retirement village to make them community and uh, village facilities as a recruitment exercise for them? And we shouldn't have to spend a cent as council on any uh, uh, normal uh, community bowling club facility. Yes, we will on the competition ones, but not on participation ones. Because someone else has got a real need to fund them, we just need to influence where they place them and suggest to them they're a strong marketing vehicle uh, for what they're trying to achieve commercially. That's a supply solution. Never that simple, just theory. Okay, let's go to the next level. I know, and I'm picking on Andy, because I know his name, if I get a gym sports and I ask for his funding plan, he's going to give me his funding plan. And he's going to show me what his fundraising strategy is by individuals, what the organisations, whether it's education groups or his own membership base is doing. He'll show me what he's trying to achieve with corporates. He'll look at how he optimises his commercial income and whether he's got any of his larger facilities, got any kind of commercial income that is actually real or joint ventures. He'll show me Foundation North and Gaming Trusts, uh, just exactly how he's trying to do it. Sometimes iwi will relate particularly to arts cultural projects. Uh, local government, where they sit in the mix and the important part they play or don't play. And also every essential government source from Tapuna Kokiri to Sport New Zealand to Lottery to whatever. So hopefully when I see any of you in a year's time, 
you will have a funding strategy by source. And against each of those, and sometimes it'll be do nothing. And that's okay. But you've got to have considered it. Okay? And where do you put your biggest resource? All right, I hope you're remembering all these key points because remember, I'm about to start asking some questions. All right? All right, next one. Types of contributions. Don't get too bogged down on jargon, right? Donations, just small personal gift is more meaningful. It's a measured decision. If this gentleman was to ask me for $100 now, I'd give it to him if he made a halfway decent case, right? If he asked me for $10,000, that's a personal gift. He'd be sitting down with me, he'd probably be talking to the boss, my wife, he'd basically get her over the line, probably get me over the line second, <laughs> and we'd actually get there together as a family, is something that we want to do, right? Special event fundraising sponsorship. I try not to use the word sponsorship because you achieve a lot much more if it's a philanthropic. If you've actually engaged a corporate that actually really wants to help you achieve your goals, uh, it, because if you start going to a sponsorship, then the hard-nosed marketing person will say, well, am I getting 50,000 worth of value, 10,000 worth of value, 100,000 worth of value? And it's a real transaction. As opposed to you convince the CEO that what you're doing is absolutely critical, and there's some really strong values alignment, and this is so important to the Auckland or Northland community that we've got to do it, and you can make connect, and then how you run off the best of your team and their team. So I don't like the word sponsorship because it's transactional. Uh, it's about invest, um, sometimes it can be a straight investment, uh, asset sales, loans, the benches, just the benches, just uh, if I put up 100,000 and I don't charge interest for a period, and then you pay it back to me. People often use the bencher strategies in the hope that the donor doesn't pay it back. I prefer to be straight up. If I'm not gonna pay it back, I, I, I'd wanna break it to them uh, really early on. It's all about integrity. Bequest, in other words, a gift of death in your will. An endowment fund can be active giving, uh, particularly target the 40 to uh, 60 year old, where you've got discretionary income as the hopefully the child burden reduces and the university fees burden reduces in this beautiful world we live in. Then the tax advantage. So if someone's asking your family to gift 5,000 a year and it's really costing you two thirds of that and you build up an endowment fund which then has 50,000 in, which the interest will then actually uh, go towards meeting the operating costs of the group you care about. And sometimes just a contract for service, e.g. Uh, a downer doing a car park and doing it at two thirds the cost and you're getting a real one third saving. All right. Okay, so let's just, I'm going to do some really simple stuff which is important. Simple is good. I'm a simple person, this is what I do every day. So I've, I've taken my group, individuals, what am I doing with membership? Have I got my membership pricing right? Have I got my different types of membership valid? Secondly, I'm going to listen to that guy that made that presentation um, on the 25th of November. I'm going to think about, is there a group in our um, uh, club or organisation that would consider giving $40 a month? And what's a compelling package we could shape that could achieve that? And then I'm going to make a prospect list and I'm going to identify maybe 100 families that might consider that. I'm going to think about the best people who might approach them. And together we're going to get this amazing coaching fund of 50000 per year to really get that key resource in place on a sustainable basis, whatever it might be. And not necessarily rely on a gaming trust where we're praying and hoping that it will come in in March. And then the question and down strategy. Have you got one? And have you got two groupings? In other words, You've got some life members there, and uh, you don't have to be wealthy to give. One of the early, earliest uh, donations I was involved with was a lady who'd been a cleaner all her life, and she gifted her freehold home uh, to the cause she cared about. It was 400000 in Tarawa, and if no one had asked her, it would have gone to a long-lost niece she hadn't seen in the UK for 25 years. And we gave her a safe vehicle to give to what she cared about. You do not have to be wealthy to be generous. Um, but equally, the same community, we had four donors in Caddy Caddy. Live in Caddy Caddy, move to Caddy Caddy. These four donors, when they die, will leave 15 million to that community. It didn't matter what we said to them, they only cared about Caddy Caddy. And that's where they're leaving their money. If we invest that at 5%, that's 750,000 going into that community forever. An endowment gift, a gift that gives forever. Okay, gift chart. You're going to get a copy of this presentation. Uh, another rule. So stay awake, uh, those tables I haven't asked, that uh, if you're trying to raise a million dollars from individual gifting, if you don't get one lead gift at 15%, you will not make it. 
right? It's, uh, it's not a bad rule. I always try to get 250, 500 if I was trying to get a million. I try to get a lead gift that actually deals to it. The best fundraising campaign, remember this one liner as well, is a campaign of one. You can find a million dollar donor, it saves you a truckload of grief. I have never done a gift chart like that. That is Orthodox Fundraising New Zealand. I always try and do it by here. 25 donors, I don't try to go to 500. It's uh, way too tiring. All right, funding matrix. Again, I know when I see any of you in uh, 12 months' time, you, a funding matrix is a useful example. You've got different projects. It might be a coaching initiative, an umpiring initiative. It might be um, an under-16 initiative. It might be a master's initiative. It might be a facility project, and there's operational funding. And then you just mark with a cross. Well, yeah, we can get gaming for that, we can't get gaming for that. We could actually possibly get lottery money for this facility project. Um, our membership funding could be directed at all four or five. But when you actually have a look at your matrix, you realise that two of the areas that are really important, probably there's only three funding sources that apply. So you have to uh, put more emphasis from those limited funding sources relevant to that project, um, rather than possibly use that funding source across five different projects. Understand what I said? Okay, matrix. What are you trying to do? What funding source applies? Just do a cross, don't do a dollar amount. It gets too complicated, right? Just have a crack. And then actually try to put a dollar amount against it and realize, uh oh, I've got a bit of a problem here. I've got to rethink how I do this. Okay, we'll go back to that early example. Uh, 10 to 20%, I'm going to go straight to the answer because of time. Uh, in the Auckland situation is different. A high school, because of our growth, in some situations they can fund right up to 100%. Foundation North will probably take quite a diminished role in today's environment, um, and our gaming trust would have to be absolutely convinced in the community outcome. Lottery Community Facilities Fund for a community facility that's school-based can be a maximum of 750000 Businesses and families, if you're trying to raise $6 million to try and get to 600000 on that kind of gift chart process, corporate or individual is probably achievable. To think there's going to be a $1 million naming right for a school-based facility, possibly think again. There's not that many corporates in that space. And council will come down to the level of shared use and what should be fairly negotiated, which could be 50%, which could be 30%, which could be 10%, could be zero. All right? And it's a harder environment in the council world to actually make that clear case. Okay, next one I want to go to. Everyone will tell you the competition's getting tougher. Well, was me. Uh, increased competition, we've got an incredibly complex media environment, uh, we've got a cynical people, hey look, uh, I'm a fundraiser, how much do you actually get for it? It's always a set fee, but it's again asking the question, what goes to the end cause, and being very, very clear about that and transparent. And also, government, always the game between central and local government, uh, and then the good old sports group, good luck, you're supposed to try and somehow magically fund it, right? So that's the environment we live in. We know the media world. You know, we get 2,000 messages each day. We've got uh, on our clickers, on our 500 channels, maybe of nothing sometimes. You know, just that's the world. How do you actually communicate your messages? It, it is challenging, right? I was with uh, one of the ma uh, major media <coughs> placement companies the other day. They said, uh, 15 years ago, it was really easy for them. They just went to TVNZ or the Herald. Uh, in today's environment, they've got to get far more strategic. I like this quote from Gandhi, kick your ass, don't moan. It can always be done, and believe me, it can always be done. So hardship uh, is not defines who we are, it tests who we are. If you've got the project right, you can fund it. Now that doesn't mean that you think it's right, that the, it's actually the right solution to the need. Then you can almost certainly get there. But you've got to get it right, you've got to get Craig doing the front end, shape what's achievable, then pull off. Okay, major donors. This one, any fundraiser will rattle this one out at you. I don't actually agree with it. That's why I've got it up, LIA. I only, <laughs> only, only use two, right? Because I have to do prospect charts every day. People will always go, uh, again, I could go to your committee and they'll say, oh, who's wealthy? Oh, okay, so Stephen Tindall, and they'll go several others and they'll rattle them off. Why would they give? What is the linkage? What is the reason that person would consider gifting? And if there's no reason, forget it. They're not going to actually contribute. So it's about linkage and interest and their ability to give will actually mean the outcome. 
So how much can someone give, how likely they give, and how connected to your organisation? Remember this line, wealth and warmth. If there's no connection with your organisation and your cause, they will not give. Okay? Wealth and warmth is the ideal target donor base. And this is what you call, I'm giving you jargon because often you get jargon rattled at you. This is what you call a constituency circle. The closer you are to the bullseye, the more likely the higher the, the potential level of major gifting. So someone that's given before at 50,000, 20,000, whatever your level of major gifting is, is obviously your key market. You manage them well, most of the time they will give again. You get people who care that are actually leading your sport. They obviously are putting a lot of time, but time is not enough. You've also got to give before you ask. If Ricky was asking me in hockey, and if he asked me for $5,000, and I flip back at Ricky, what have you given, and he says nothing, chances are I will not give anything. It's peer asking peer. And so if John Williamson is asking me, and he's saying, hey, look, I've gifted 10000 Steve, and I need you to give me 10000 then I will seriously think about it. If, if Ricky or John were to respond, I'm just giving my time, great. I'll give you my time listening to you. I'm probably actually not going to actually make a gift. So it's give before you ask. Okay, existing donors, and then obviously your membership base, the former members, and then those people that care. The further you go out in the circle, the harder it is to basically get them over the line with gifting, or they have different levels of gifting. Okay, so this is what I do every day. So I've got the funding A-team, we've recruited them out of squash, they're sitting here at this table, they're, they're amazing. They are people that are connected, that care, I've got the best possible group, taking a lot of time saying, I want you, I want you, I want you. Okay, and we're sitting down at the kitchen table, we're saying, right, can we identify the individuals that we actually think are most likely to give? And we're going to take this character called Steve. And his reason to give, well, his children play um, uh, rip, rip squash, and he was a former squash coach. And we've got different brackets of levels. It might be under a thousand dollars, it might be a thousand to five thousand, it might be above five thousand, it might be above ten thousand, depending on what we're talking about. We actually think he's a medium level, however we define that. We don't get too bogged down on that, but as much as we know, and we talk about the donor with total respect. And then who best to approach? Well, probably there's Harry or Sally that he's probably been around the squash circuit with for the last decade. And he really respects either of those two. And if they were to ask, because their parents in similar positions, then that would probably be the most meaningful approach. Every donor is a campaign. It's all about me. If you're asking me, what do you need to do to actually connect with me and get me over the line? Okay? So, prospect list. And then I say to the group, this is my A-team, go forth. You've got to do one ask, in the next four weeks. And we're going to meet again. And you can take anyone with you from the group that's going to work for that donor. And if you choose really carefully, then the first 15 people often you ask, you're never going to know. Right? And I've run hundreds and hundreds of campaigns. You get that right, and you get the ask right, and the person doing the asking right. And so you've been really, really clear about your case, the reasons to give, who's doing the asking, and I, you actively listen, and you might change on the spot. Okay, so I'm just going to go back. All right, Gr regroup. There's been another five or six key things in there. Quickly uh, regurgitate to each other. All right, so Lee Dana, thank, thanks, Duncan, that's great. All right, just want to do this one cost of fundraising. If you use direct mail, for every dollar you spend on direct mail, you probably get a dollar in. Telemarketing, I hate telemarketing. It, it works for some of the health causes, um, but I mean, I don't know, when they ring you at home, I, I just go bang now. I'm not, I'm not even polite, or I pass it to my daughter, and she, she, she whacks me. Um, but it uh, can be often about a 33% cost. In other words, if you're giving a dollar, then effectively 33% is often getting paid for the contractors to do it. Capital fundraising, if you're trying to raise $10 million, you may have to spend a million getting there. That, uh, what do I end up working on? Uh, 100 campaigns, probably working about 5 or 6%. Uh, that's where what's reality. When you look at all the different resources that you've got to commit, but uh, that's the Fundraising Institute of New Zealand guideline. Bequest giving, see how low that cost is? 
and uh, it just if you don't do it, big market, go after it. It actually produces big dividends. Okay, so because of time, and Anita's going to get grumpy with me, everyone asks about social media, creating the motive response. Um, you're going to get all these slides. Uh, quite a lot of them are uh, obvious, so I'm hardly going to touch them. But create that emotive response, engage with them, and don't forget to ask. And I'm going to go this one. Think. You can never thank a donor enough. There are too many instances, and I've been a member of the sporting community for the last 30, 40 years, where a gift is received and people do not think. Will you think once? not 10 times. Someone told me a story this morning, it was Tony Gill, the National Grants Manager. A donor has thanked them every year for a gift they gave about nine years ago. Right? Whenever they wanted them, they come and say thank you. It's powerful. That donor, if that group ever asks again, they'll sit up for getting money. This one, uh, social media, is really, really useful for building connections. And it's building their potential donor base, not so much good for actually raising money. Like, sure, crowd fundraising. But it's so more important what people say about your organisation than what you say about yourself. If you've got a fantastic people saying that is an amazing organisation and they just run a fantastic uh, range of services for all different age groups, that's incredibly powerful. And it's your best, best backdrop to optimise giving. Oh, I, I like this one, I can't skip past it. Facebook activism, you relate to this. It's motivated people to make a real sacrifice uh, by motivating people to do the things that people do when they're not motivated enough <laughs> to make a real sacrifice. I really do think that uh, does apply to a lot of web-based gifting. But, um, but uh, great. There's some quite key points there on social media. You'll read through them and hopefully you understand it. What I want to do is just go big picture on collaboration now. And I've got about five, ten minutes, so I'm just going to paint some things to you. I'm doing a lot of work for Auckland Council at the moment with uh, Stephen Town, CE. He's got a neat line. Just by having a fresh way of looking at things, new connections, you can often pull stuff off. Right? It's uh, part of what we're calling realising Auckland's potential. And from a philanthropic perspective, how we link with corporates, uh, with all individuals, uh, public funders, to achieve not Auckland Council's uh, goals, Auckland Inc. How are we achieving a better Auckland together? Some of the feedback we got, it's about long-term values-based relationships. We entered in, I can't say, the corporate, a corporate who has made a lot of money in Auckland, had done no philanthropy, and they have just committed 2.5 million. And they had to be asked. And they had to be asked in the right way, in this case by the CE, and for a project that they actually cared about. But they've made a lot of money out of Auckland over the last 20 years, but no one had ever actually asked them at a meaningful level. Right. And strategic, not a transactional approach. We're not just trying to solve something, you actually, they're a part of something. And if you're a part of something, that's incredibly powerful. And our approach is, we're probably talking to about 70 different corporates, and as we're solving those corporates, like one of the things we're working with Andy on, he's trying to fund a gym sports, and it's 3.6 million. And if a third should be council, and if a third potential in that case can almost be debt serviced and a third can be public funders with a little bit of help by their group. Um, it's actually working with groups to actually solve it and engineer it. Um, you've still got to do the hard yards, but trying to give some early guidance as much as we can. Develop the partner family, match with real opportunities, and you've got to make. If it's not real, if it's a wish rather than a need, dead in the water, it won't fly. Craig will either kill it or I'll kill it off. Right, from capital funding or sustainability. Okay, community-wide endowment really works. Uh, an endowment, capital remains intact. I give 100,000, I give 100,000 to the squash group I care about. Every year they get a 5% of a $5,000 check forever. Incredibly powerful. As I, I'm only 52, whatever, 53, these like 52. Um, just, but as I get into the later stages of life, I want to make a difference. If someone doesn't ask me, and, I'm, and then I might give to two or three causes I care about and leave the gift of my will. And I decide. And I might just want to give to Auckland. I might just give it to Greenhide, where I live, like the Caddy Caddy example. Uh, it can be place based giving, it can be organisational based giving, doesn't matter. Don't know the science. Auckland Communities Foundations, 
Auckland Council is investing in Auckland's Community Foundation. We want them to do this space much, much better going forward so they can get alongside your groups. They are really working hard to start to achieve that. Endowment, it is a slow game, right? Uh, this is the Tauranga, uh, I was involved in Tauranga. We now have in Tauranga 120 million committed from 250 donors if they all die tomorrow. We only have 12, 13 million in the bank at the moment. There's quite a few that are about to die. They're in the last stages of life. And the number of endowment funds, we had to convince everyone we were credible and then we started to get on average two bequests per month. And yet you got it at a board table when someone dies, you're not quite sure what to do. Um, so, but we had zero money for the first four years, right? And then we started to move. And that curve is now going like that. And we had a strategy which was professional advisor based, direct donor approach based, and marketing based. This is one case where doing it together can really work, and you then form a group that targets in your code. But often, if Ricky sees the Bramley family and we care about hockey, my wife also cares about natural health and something else. We'll probably do one gift, uh, one, we'll change our world once and we'll leave for three causes. Right? If you don't do what my wife wants, Ricky will not get any money for hockey. Right? But you've got to shape it, ask once, get it right for the donor. About people, I want to tell these stories. Uh, so some of the last messaging to leave on. This lady wasn't wealthy, left 72,000 uh, at death. Um, this was in 2012, over the uh, probably the next seven, eight years after the wall came out of probate, 30, 31,000 allocated, in her fund is 74. The capital remains intact. This gentleman uh, literally almost got summoned to his deathbed. Uh, his son and his wife had preceded them. Um, he gifted 1.3 million, uh, probably over a period of about uh, five years after uh, we worked through the estate. A uh, quarter of a million gifted and sitting on 1.4. Incredibly powerful, right? And sometimes it can be broad based, the donor decides. There's people out there at, uh, that are involved with your sport that care. Have you maintained? Nothing worse than the first time you have contact with a donor, would you consider gifting? Right? Sydney University, best, best example I can think of in Australasia, do not go to Sydney University, you'll get tracked for the rest of your life. Right? You come out with a degree, they'll send you a very nice email for the next five years, hope you're going really well out there in the workforce, um, love you Steve. Right? After five years I perceive that I might actually be starting to earn some money and they'll be asking me along to a couple of social functions and they'll be asking me to then pay a membership fee. Then when I had about 10 years, they knew I was in the maths department and say, oh Steve, would you like to consider doing a 50,000 gift towards the maths department? And then they will track me again another five years later. And they'll say, but they have built a relationship with me and if they're actually managing it correctly in the right way, they will take me on that journey. Right? So how do we do it in sport? We've got an amazing database, but are we managing that people and are we also resourcing it to actually care? People care about sport and keep them connected. All right, this, this is another neat one, just really quickly, uh, payroll giving. One of the best examples in Australasia is Geelong, it's got a 200,000 population. What happens in Geelong, they've been doing it for 50 years. Um, they go to a corporate, they choose the youngest and brightest, they have to then sell into their own corporate payroll giving and then for the next six weeks they have to go and do two or three other presentations to corporates, which their CEO says, rings into the CEO, please actually look after Steve, he's a bit nervous, he's going to come and see you. And You've got the sales force, and what actually happens is there's 1,700 people. So if you go to a Chamber of Commerce function in Geelong, they go, oh, I was the class of 82. I oh, know I was the class of 85. It's actually an institution. They have the highest level of payroll giving. Very good example where collaboration works. And community-wide endowment, in every lawyer in Tauranga, you have an Acorn Foundation pamphlet, and we have educated the estate lawyer, the senior partner, and the receptionist. You can't often do that as one person. Right? or one organisation. Investor forums, be aware they exist. Uh, in, uh, in Auckland we have a Sport and Rec Investors Forum and an Arts Cultural Forum. I'll just talk about the sports one because it's relevant uh, to this group. We look at uh, projects normally above 2 million and we try to avoid wasting a lot of people's time. You know that funding profile we started with? So we look at Andy's gym sports, 3.6 million. And at the table, we've got Auckland Council, we've got Sport New Zealand, we've got Active, we've got Lion Foundation, we've got the Trust Foundation, NZCT, sure not all the Gaming Trust, just some of them, and Foundation North. And we seem to check it. Okay, uh, is this valid? 
That's the first question. We fire that question at Anita in Auckland Council. If she nods, okay, play ball. Let's actually have a conversation about it. So where do we each need to get to if we're serious about pulling this off and what is a fair ask that we can ask on that group? Okay, so it does, it's not a decision-making body. It is just there to try and actually, together, pull stuff off and not put you into a 10-year spin where you go nowhere. So that's, that's the role of that group. And this is me finishing. Never try and get a no, and no only means no today. And I love Winston, not, not to our politician, Churchill. Uh, never, 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 never give up. All right. So that is fundraising, not <coughs> one, one, two one. I hope you're remembering the key things. You will get a copy of the presentation. And hopefully I've run out of time so I get no hard questions. Fantastic. <laughs>